This is Psych Boost helping you with your psychology qualification one video at a time. This video is on language, and in this 14th GCSE video, we're going to be covering language and thought. But before I start, the very kind support of students and teachers who donate on Patreon help me help you by continuing to make these videos and resources. A very big thank you for your help, guys. To join them, follow this link. For everyone, you might want to check out the free worksheet for this video and the quiz. So here are the terms on the AQA GCSE specification we're going to cover in this video. As we go through the video, they're going to be in red text. You need to be able to respond to questions on all of this. Let's get started. So in this video, we're going to be considering two competing theories about the relationship between language and the thoughts that language represents. And it's an interesting chicken and egg question. Do I actually know what an object or idea is if I don't have the word for it? Or on the other hand, can I actually use a word properly without knowing what the concept it's based on? So faced with that problem, what comes first, the ideas or the words? So to help us unpack this problem, let's start with Piaget, who might have had what seems at first to be the more common sense perspective. Piaget thinks that before being able to use a word, we need to develop a mental concept of what that thing is, a schema. When that child has developed their schema, they can then use that knowledge to express their thoughts with language. We've used the word schema before, but as a reminder, a schema is a mental package of information we have about concepts. And we build those schemas together through experience. Piaget suggests that the use of language in certain ways is only possible for children when they've reached a certain stage of cognitive development. If you've already watched my video on Piaget's stages of development, you should already be familiar with the names of these stages. The first stage of language development is the sensorimotor stage. Babies in this stage are first learning how to use their bodies, and this includes vocalizations and imitating sounds. At the pre-operational stage, children voice their thoughts in a basic way, but struggle to communicate effectively with language. At the concrete operational stage, children can now use language well, but only to talk about physical objects. At the formal operational stage, children can talk about abstract ideas and logic. So, one of the main advantages of Piaget's theory is it has face validity. It seems to match what most people's experience of how children develop language. But there isn't much evidence in support of Piaget's ideas on language. Part of the problem is studying internal mental processes like schema development in relation to language is difficult to do objectively, especially as babies are participants who can't self-report. And the alternate Sapir-Whorf hypothesis has more experimental evidence, suggesting how we think and perceive depends on language. So what is a Sapir-Whorf hypothesis? Well, this suggests that in order to be able to think about a concept, we need to be able to express it in words. It follows that if a culture doesn't have a word for an idea or object, they can't understand the concept in the same way as a culture that does have the word. Now, this idea is called linguistic determinism, that the structure of our language shapes how we think. And it has two varieties. What I've suggested is a hard version, that without the words, I can't even think about the idea that the word represents. And there's a soft version, that the range of words I have for objects changes our perception of them. Okay, this is getting a little complicated. I'm going to give you some examples to show you what I mean. If you live in the Solomon Islands, you would have nine words for coconut. In the Philippines, there are 92 words for rice. It's likely that coconuts and rice form a much bigger part of the lives of the people who live in those societies than yours. Could the extra words help the people who speak those languages experience coconuts and rice differently to you? A more extreme example is the number of words Inuit have for snow. The exact number is contested, but a study in 2006 identified over a thousand words relating to snow, ice, freezing and melting in the Sami language. Surely with such a range of ways to talk about snow, the Sami people must have a very different perception of reality when it comes to snow. We're going to now look at research that suggests that, yes, the recall of events and the recognition of colour seems to be influenced by the language you speak, supporting the Sapo Whorf hypothesis. Sapo and Whorf were both influenced by Native American language, so we're going to focus on the Native Americans, but I'm also going to give an example of the effect in another culture. 
So, starting with events. If the use of different words in our language changes our perception, then it should change how we interpret events. Worf studied the language of a Native American group called the Hopi. The Hopi language didn't seem to have the normal concept of time, so no words for past, present and future. Worf suggested that without these words, the Hopi people didn't experience time and were timeless. Now, this original work has been heavily criticised, with later work showing that even though the Hopi language is unusual, they do have ways to talk about events being related to time. But research between Spanish and English speakers found that the languages have a very different way of speaking about accidents. English speakers would say, he broke the vase, while Spanish speakers would say, the vase broke. Now the research has found in recall, English speakers were more likely to remember who broke the vase, but not that it was an accident. And Spanish speakers were more likely to recall it being an accident, but not who broke it. Now this suggests that the perception of the same incident changed depending on the language that was used. It's an interesting finding with implications for things like eyewitness testimony. We've looked at the recall of events, let's finish the video with recognition of colours. Now there's a very interesting range of research about the development of colour words in language and what that tells us about perception. And the research in this field has been argued all over the decades. I'm only going to mention a little bit here because I'm trying to keep these videos to just what you need for your GCSE. But in the comments of this video and on my website, I'm going to share a link to a really interesting video by Vox. All humans have colour vision, but the colours we perceive are part of a wide spectrum. How we divide the spectrum shows how we perceive colours as separate from one another. So variations in language in relation to colour suggests variations in perception. It was noticed in old Greek stories, the word blue was never used. It was suggested that, without the word, the ancient Greeks had no perception of blue. Later researchers working studying the Zuni people found they didn't have separate words for orange and yellow, and had difficulty telling the difference between them compared to English speakers. This finding of the Native Americans is supported by research on native Russian speakers, who have two words for different states of blue. The research showed that the Russian speakers could perceive differences between the shades of blue faster than the English speakers suggesting they have different perception of blue. However, researchers looking at the development of language around the world shows that most languages develop the same colour words in a set order. This suggests there is a shared colour perception between people of all cultures. Here are three additional evaluations for the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Well, one practical application is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis can be used to explain the cognitive underperformance of poorer students. This is due to them lacking a complex vocabulary, also known as an elaborated code. This knowledge can inform teachers in designing classes that improve vocabulary to help children with general understanding of the world. And while there might be many differences in the number of words for objects or ideas in different languages, the way these languages are used might make any difference in perception limited. For example, the word snow in English can be used with descriptive words that add meanings such as soft, powdery and wet. And the practical differences between most languages is limited. Movies are often translated between many languages without changing the meaning of the script. Okay, now we cover the content. You do need to be able to use that information to actually answer questions. So here are five questions I've made to test your skills. Pause the video and give them a go. For those of you who support me on Patreon, I've put together an additional bonus video showing you how to answer these properly. For everybody else, Thanks for watching, liking, subscribing, and I'll see you in the next video on language, human and animal.